Um, can everyone hear me? Excellent. Um, so I'm Rebecca Robinson, um, granddaughter of Stephen Strom. Uh, and together we spent the last three and a half years working on the book we'll be reading from tonight, Voices from Bears Ears Seeking Common Ground on Sacred Land. And tonight we want to share with you the story of how Bears Ears National Monument came to be and came to be undone as it, as it was last year the missed opportunities to find common ground on public lands issues, um, the sometimes painful and often contentious history that informs the Bears Ears debate, and possible hope for the future of this sacred landscape. Um, so as many of you know, um, the Bears Ears National Monument was established in December 2016 by then President Barack Obama. Um, it was established using um, an act called the Antiquities Act, which gives the president unilateral authority to establish national monuments uh, to protect the land in perpetuity. Um, what's significant about the landscape um, is the size of do, uh, the size of land protected, this uh, represents 1.35 million acres of land in southeastern Utah, um, land that is not only near and dear to many conservationists' heart, but also deeply sacred to five tribes who trace their ancestry to the region, uh, the Navajo, Ute, Hopi, Zuni, and Ute Mountain Ute tribes. Um, and Another thing that's unique about this is this is a result of a proposal presented by those tribes um, in which they propose to co-manage this land with agencies in the federal government, the BLM and the Forest Service, something that had never been done before. Uh, and so it was a beautiful thing, this reflection of um, both conservationists and tribes' vision to protect this landscape that means so much to so many. And to kind of set the stage and give you a, a vivid picture of what this land looks like and why it is so special, um, we're going to read from the preface of our book. The best way to comprehend Bearsy's country is to take wing. With the benefit of a bird's eye view, the scale and rhythm of a landscape spanning 3,000 square miles comes into full relief. Endless spires, buttes, mesas, and canyons, sculpted and painted by water and wind, streams and rivers through whose veins and arteries the desert's lifeblood and scarcest resource flows. The vast terrain bears scars as well, of explosive emergence and tectonic shifts that sculpted the earth into otherworldly formations of stark cinder cones, petrified sand dunes, and impossibly steep ridges, all painted with a wild palette of colors. It is country that both tests the body and stirs the soul. In a landscape that often looks and feels empty, one is constantly reminded that humans made a life and a living here long before our time. Enter any of the canyons in this expansive region, each one like a sandstone fingerprint, completely unique, and you will find evidence of ancient civilizations that thrived in a harsh climate, building stone structures and crafting pottery, tools, and weapons, remnants of which have survived for centuries, even millennia. The canyons bear silent witness to the earliest settlers of this land, the native peoples whose descendants trace their creation and migration stories to the Bears Ears region. Weathered wooden fence posts and old cattle corrals dot the many miles of open range in San Juan County, evidence of the area's first Anglo settlers, Mormon pioneers who in 1879 made a pilgrimage through rugged and punishing terrain to establish the San Juan Mission in present-day Bluff, Utah. Those are... Um, so this is, uh, this is a map of the Hole in the Rock Trail that Mormon pioneers took from the southwestern part of Utah across some pretty punishing terrain. If any of you are familiar with Escalante or uh, Glen Canyon um, and the Abajo Mountains, you'll know that it is, it is rugged to say the least. And this was done in, uh, in covered wagons with horses. So it's, it's um, you'll go back, that's fine. Um, so, I think it's actually a couple slides forward. This is our first presentation, so bear with us. Um, <laughs> um, both Anglo, ma mainly Mormon, Utahns, and Natives express powerful cultural and spiritual attachment to the land. Why, then, did the Bears Ears Monument elicit such debate before it was established by President Obama? And what led to the unprecedented executive order? 
by President Trump to reduce the monument boundaries by 85%. So, almost exactly a year after President Obama establishes Bears Ears, President Trump issues an executive order to reduce the boundaries drastically in the acreage from 1.35 million to just under 230,000 acres. And you'll see the dotted line is what uh, Obama's monument used to be, and then these uh, orangish areas are what remains. So you have these two non-contiguous units, um, and it, it the argument put forth by the Trump administration, influenced heavily by the Utah congressional delegation, was that um, this was not in accordance with um, the statement in the Antiquities Act um, that, uh, that it should protect the smallest area compatible for proper care and management of objects. So what they did was they looked at Obama's proclamation and they sort of cherry-picked a couple of regions where there, was, uh, there were dense archaeological resources and said, well, that's fine. That's all we need to protect. What's the big deal? Um, and obviously tribes and conservationists and people who, who have a deep connection to this land saw this as, as a real affront um, to the area that they tried so hard to protect. Um, and another uh, undercurrent of all of this is that um, it's a mineral-rich re region. There's uranium bears the potential for, for oil and gas. And so by reducing this monument, um, suddenly you have these areas once again open to oil and gas and mining exploration. Um, so that's the, that's the backstory to our story. Um, so we'll be reading more from Voices tonight. Um, and there's a complimentary book as well, um, Views from Bears Ears, Views, Views from a Sacred Land, um, which is really a showcase for Steve's landscape photography. It's a real vis visual evocation of the landscape. Um, I wrote a historical introduction, and then the native poet Joy Harjo um, wrote a piece as well. So really the theme undergirding our work is the shared cultural and spiritual connections to the land that these people with widely differing political and religious views have. San Juan County's modern day inhabitants follow different faiths and have varying traditions of living on the land. What binds them together is that in their own ways, they each view the land as sacred and feel that they are called to steward it so it sustains their people today and into the future. Their competing visions for how best to do so animate one of the central struggles for the future of the American West. In our book, we hope to capture a rich narrative, a juxtaposition of Native and Mormon cultures, a clash between local, state, and federal interests, a study of the complex forces at work in rural America today. Through the stories of 20 individuals and interviews with 50 more, Voices from Bears Ears captures the passions of those who fought for Bears Ears and those who opposed the monument as a federal land grab that threatened to rob them of their economic future. It gives voice to those who have felt silenced, ignored, or disrespected. And this is just a sampling of some of the 70-odd uh, people with whom we spoke. Um, it was a really broad and diverse range of people over the course of three-ish years. Um, and... As we talk to people um, across um, many thousands of miles uh, in San Juan County and um, neighboring southwestern Colorado, New Mexico, went to different tribal reservations, went um, on an ATV ride with, um, with some Mormons, three themes emerged from the conversations that we had uh, with people about their connection to the land. Number one, um, everyone expressed a very strong cultural and and spiritual attachment to this land. Many people felt as if their voices hadn't been heard, um, either by the national media, by uh, faraway politicians in Washington who had no connection to the landscapes on the ground, um, and people faced an uncertain economic future. Um, would these economies continue to be extractive industry-based? Would they create an economy around, um, around tourism based on conservation of landscapes, which has been done successfully in any number of regions in the West? So there's really this tension between, you know, where, where is this county uh, and its residents going to go um, economically and culturally? How this book came to be... <laughs> Um, 
well. I think there's a great slide to accompany that. <laughs> uh, so that's that's me several decades ago, um, along with uh, in 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 high uh, late '80s fashion, um, with my uh, with my grand mother and, and Steve's late wife, Karen, um, the two of them had introduced me uh, to these landscapes for many years. I first went to this region when I was four years old, um, and the Red Rock country has really, really wormed its way into my heart. And, um, and as many of you know, if you've been to these regions, it's sort of impossible not to feel a very strong connection um, and I met my husband um, on a river rafting and backpacking trip in, on the San Juan River and in Dark Canyon. So, um, it, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so it has, um, it has deep personal significance for me. And it was, um, uh, it was really the, the passing of, um, of Karen in April 2014 that led us to think about starting a project to honor her memory. This is actually a photo of us at um, a celebration of her life at Muley Point um, in southeastern Utah. And that's really where the conversations um, about this book began. That's, that's me. <laughs> And I thought I'd mention my connection uh, to this land, which goes back to the late 1970s when Karen and I uh, took summers off from uh, our uh, careers as research scientists at the National Optical Astronomy Observatory to teach uh, on the Navajo reservation, specifically at what was then called Navajo Community College. And through um, uh, meeting Harry Walters and his wife Anna, uh, then Rain Parish, and ultimately Joy Harjo, uh, we were introduced uh, not only uh, to the landscape uh, of northeast Arizona and southern uh, Utah, uh, but also to any number of native writers and artists, and it was through those connections that we were able to, to start uh, with um, uh, both aspects of our exploration, both the visual exploration and the exploration with the folks who live on the land. very personal ways of relating to the land, um, what we didn't yet know was um, how the people who actually live on the land um, have uh, what that deep connection they have um, looks like. And we wanted to begin by looking at the native cultural and spiritual connections to the Bears Ears region. Um, and we'll do that with um, a passage for, written by the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition, the Coalition of Tribes that petitioned Obama for, to create the National Monument. We are a spiritual people. However, our holy practices happen right here on earth, not in a church, but in special places like bear's ears. We sometimes talk to the plants, others sing to the mountains, and we seek out our ancestors who still roam this land, and we ask them for guidance in a language they can understand. In times long past, the ancient ones sanctified the land in its special places, and the blessings remain in force today. Native peoples of the Colorado Plateau see their origin and migration stories manifest in the land, its sculptural forms, and its flora and fauna. The canyons and gulches of Cedar Mesa, the buttes of Valley of the Gods, and the backbone of Comb Ridge figure prominently in the creation stories of Native American tribes and pueblos in the Southwest. Evidence of Native peoples' forebears abounds in abandoned adobe structures built into the sides of seemingly unreachable sheer cliffs. Celestial events, animals, and human-like figures depicted in petroglyphs carved into rock and pictographs painted on protected sandstone walls. A rich trove of baskets, pottery, and jewelry, and the buried remains of those who came before. In San Juan County alone, estimates place the uh, number of ancestral Puebloan, Ute, and Navajo sites at well over 100,000. We spoke with a number of native residents of San Juan County who were engaged in efforts to protect their ancestral lands. One of those individuals is Joni Yellowman. He's a traditional Navajo healer, um, a member of a group uh, called Utah Denebikea, um, which was one of the earliest groups to advocate for protection of the Bears Ears region. Um, so the way we'll do this is um, I'll, um, I'll read um, sort of the interstitial text, and Steve will read quotes from Jonah, and then we'll hear an audio clip of Jonah's actual voice. Trained as a healer and spiritual leader, Joni Yellowman has spent a lifetime seeking connection with the voices of the earth. 
mountains, rivers, plants, insects, and animals. To Yellowman and to native peoples across the Colorado Plateau, every living thing is sacred, possessing spiritual power and religious significance. The earth itself is a living, breathing being, akin to and beloved as a family member, someone to hear and honor through prayer and ceremony. This is why I was put here on this world, for this. I thank our Maker and pray for everybody. Every time they ask me, can you say a prayer for us, I always do. As he speaks, his mesmerizing hand movements slowly transport us into a world in which stories are circular. Oh, okay. You want to keep going and we can... Yeah, we could do that. Um... Reflecting on what has already been violated or lost, Yellowman speaks mournfully about mining operations that have stripped mountains and mesas for their mineral wealth, left irreparable wounds in the earth, and severed relationships with the past. It's a sad thing, Yellowman uh, said. Who's going to fix it? We don't have the prayers for it. We don't have the songs for it. There's a scar there that we don't know how to fix. We don't want that anymore. By healing, I think that's how we can leave it like this. He says, holding his arms out as if to embrace the land around him, mostly untouched by humans, with no oil derricks or signs of mining activity in view. Yellowman grew up hearing from some people what many natives heard and at times still do hear, that he was a simple man, incapable of doing much of consequence in a world based on practicalities, hard facts, and competition. A lot of people, they say in a lot of different ways, you guys don't know how to do this. We've been downgraded. He and the coalition of tribes are eager to prove them wrong, to demonstrate that they can leave, lead a movement that will fundamentally change the way Native peoples are perceived by the dominant culture and to empower Indigenous people everywhere to advocate for protection of their ancestral lands. I think it's going to open a lot of minds. From here on, if we're going to talk about this land, we're going to hear histories. We're going to see and know and understand. Um, so Mormons have a deep uh, connection to this land as well. Um, they believe that they were called by their Heavenly Father to endure this arduous journey from southwestern to southeastern Utah to establish um, the first Mormon mission in southeast Utah. Um, their descendants have called this area home since the 1880s and uh, for generations, they've mined, ranched, and farmed in this land and made a living in some um, very uh, forbidding and challenging territory. So we spoke with about Mormon theology and land stewardship with um, George Handley, who's a professor at Brigham Young University and a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And this is what he had to say about the connection between uh, Mormon theology and land stewardship. Reverence for nature and a calling to take from the earth only what are, is needed are enshrined in Mormon theology. And on a personal level, Anglo-Mormon residents of San Juan County express a deep spiritual attachment to the canyons, rivers, mesas, and wide open spaces of their homeland. Stewardship is a very strong principle in Mormon theology. The teachings speak to preserving resources, keeping them healthy, as well as the idea of being mindful of future generations not taking more than you need, making sure you are respectful of creation. It's a beautiful, much-needed concept. So what accounts for the disparity between this love for land and the anti-tree-hugger rhetoric espoused by many uh, Utah politicians and some rural Utahns as well? Stewardship in recent generations has lost more of its environmental implications. The term stewardship is implied to mean development, a lot of Mormons can't understand this need to preserve wilderness. God gave us resources on this planet for a reason. They're intended to be used. The idea of preserving something in perpetuity doesn't make sense, especially when the territory has something that we need. The idea of regulation and imposition from outside doesn't sit well with many Mormons, especially those living in rural Utah. It boils down to a kind of position of distrust toward the federal government. You'll get a feel for where that distrust originates uh, as we go on. Um, but first, and hopefully... But I hope somewhere in the story that you'll use the word <laughs> sacred. These places are sacred to me. I go to these places to, to pray, to take photographs, to look at the stars, to 
a look at the beautiful landscape in the same, you know, it's just as sacred to me as it would be to a Navajo elder. So I hope that part of the story gets told. So that's K. Shumway. He is um, a descendant of the original Mormon pioneers. Sorry. <laughs> the, uh, de a descendant of the original Mormon pioneers. His roots in San Juan County go back, um, like many San Juan County residents, um, six or seven generations. This is a photo of um, his family cabin um, near a place called Fiddler's Green in San Juan County. Um, and as you heard Cade say, these landscapes are, are sacred. It's where um, he and his wife and his family go to pray. Um, and this is where there's, there's a really interesting twist between um, the spiritual connection to the land and uh, the control of that land by the federal government. Ironically, it was following his passion for photography that exposed Kay to restrictions on accessing these wild places, which he used to wander freely. This road I used to run around on had a closure sign on it. This place I used to go on Cedar Mesa is closed, as are a number of places deemed ecologically and culturally sensitive by the Bureau of Land Management. It made me feel like maybe some person was going to photograph me and write me up. It got to be at, to the point where we would grumble among ourselves. We were thinking, what can we possibly do to show these federal agencies how the local people feel when they're shut out of these places they've always loved for generations? So Jonah and, and Kay really give, a, give you a sense for um, the connection that, that people have to this land um, and the, the different ways that they want to see it preserved and protected. Um, there have been a number of uh, attempts by people over uh, the past century and change to protect this land, and I'll preface this by saying that this is a, an absolutely whirlwind history course. This is, you know, 120 years of history in five minutes or less, and you can read far more in our book, Shameless Plug. Uh, so uh, I, the most important, uh, the thing that's most pertinent to our story is um, by the late 19th and early 20th century, um, looting of native artifacts in this region led to passage of the Antiquities Act, the, um, the much debated and contentious law that led to the creation of Bears Near as a National Monument. It was signed into law by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, and the most crucial part of this wonky document um, is the blue text, um, protecting objects of historic or scientific interest that are situated upon the lands owned or controlled by the government of the U.S. to be national monuments. And this is that, you know, sticking point again, confined to the smallest area compatible with proper care and management of the objects to be protected. Um, and this is really at the core of that Obama-Trump uh, battle. So, jumping forward a few decades to 1936, um, then Interior Secretary Harold Igis proposes um, a, an ambitious uh, Escalante National Monument. Um, as you can see, it's, it's a massive area that includes parts of the Bears Ears National Monument, encompasses most of Canyonlands National Park. Oh, oh a stick. Um, <laughs> uh, part of Capitol Reef National Park. Um, I forget the acreage on it, but it was it was... Uh, massive, somewhere approaching two million acres. It, uh, the proposal died um, among pro due to protests among local ranchers and miners, and it's, it really set the stage for the tensions we have today, uh, the battle between, um, between using the land for economic gain and conserving it for um, its ecological uh, value. Um, and then, ah, we're in the mid-60s now. So then Interior Secretary Stuart Udall and Bates Wilson, who was then the superintendent of Arches uh, National Park, helped create Canyonlands National Park. Um, it's, not, it's not the, uh, I don't think I need it for this, but okay. thank you. I'll hold on to it. <laughs> um, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very small area they ended up protecting, but it was nonetheless a very significant victory in land protection um, in, in Utah. Um, 
And then where are we going next? Ah, yes. Um, the mid-90s, the Utah congressional delegation introduced the Utah Public Lands Management Act. Ostensibly, this was supposed to strike a balance between um, resource extraction, multiple use, and conservation, um, but many conservationists said it had too many poison pills. It, it was not, it was a conservation bill in, in name only. So as a response to this, uh, what conservationists saw as this heinous bill, um, President Clinton declared the Grand Staircase Escalante a national monument, um, and that really inflamed uh, the passions of, of people in uh, southern Utah. Um, and to be clear, some, some folks in southern Utah were very much in support of preserving this landscape, but there were many others who, uh, who thought this was uh, that that term that that comes up oh so often a federal land grab that robbed local people of um, a chance to um, to mine and ranch the land further um, and the and this federal land grab idea uh, figures very prominently in the debate over bears ears and the grand staircase is referred to any number of times um, in in uh, locals arguing against the establishment of Bears Ears. Um, and and uh, moreover, the, the really cr critical thing to understand about the difference between Grand Staircase and Bears Ears is Grand Staircase was essentially a behind-closed-doors process, according to people who were involved with said process. Um, there was not consultation with locals. This was sort of done because they knew that if they tried to have a stakeholder process, it most likely would fail and the land wouldn't be protected. Whereas um, Bears Ears National Monument, there was a multi-year, multi-stakeholder effort to, invi uh, to involve different groups and tribes. Um, and so they're really not that similar, and yet they really became equated in the debate over bear's ears. Okay. Um, tw in 2010, um, this is really where our book, where the heart of our book resides, is these new attempts to share the future, of, to shape the future of public lands in Utah. Um, and there was an effort that began in 2010 by the Utah Navajo to identify and protect cultural sites. Um, and what does cultural sites mean? It means um, ancestral sites. It means archaeological um, objects. It means places that are still used um, for hunting and wood gathering and medicinal, medicinal plants. Um, and so the group we mentioned earlier, Utah Dene Bikea, um, uh, was formed to sort of oversee this effort, and they engaged with Utah politicians and said, hey, we have this idea for protecting this landscape. Um, can we work together to find a solution? Um, and at the same time, um, the late Senator Bob Bennett of Utah, he had just overseen um, a process in Washington County, in the southwestern part of Utah, Home Design National Park. He just overseen a multi-stakeholder process to find compromise on public lands issues. It had, you know, been a rousing success. He turned his eye to San Juan County and thought, well, maybe this is a place where we could achieve similar compromise. Um, and critically, he wanted tribal input and invited tribes to participate. Unfortunately, he was defeated by now Senator Mike Lee in the Tea Party uprising of 2010, so his uh, vision never came to pass. Nevertheless, um, the tribes persisted. Um, uh, so, so what they did several years later is they proposed a, um, a national conservation area in San Juan County. Um, and they really, this was really the first effort to try and involve natives in the management of the land so that they could have input on not just, you know, where, where you can put a trail or whatnot, but that these sacred sites and places where um, wood is gathered, medicinal plants, what have you, would receive priority for protection. It was a pretty unprecedented uh, effort at the time. Um, concurrently, Representative Rob Bishop, recently elected to his ninth term, um, <laughs> it, uh, tried this uh, effort similar to Senator Bennett's called the Public Lands Initiative, or PLI. Um, instead of just focusing on one county to do this whole public lands thing, he uh, decided to focus on eight, including San Juan County. Um, San Juan County commissioners and tribes were involved in this effort. Um, initially, it looked promising, but um, eventually the tribes withdrew from these discussions because they felt disrespected, um, and that is when they went forward to pursue the National Monument. 
All right. Did we get through the history? Yes. All right. Um, sort of, kind of. Um, so the question that really, one of the questions that stuck with us through our, you know, two and a half, three years of research was, can both sides overcome their painful history to create a shared future? Um, and again, a whirlwind history for you. Um, you know, the native uh, history uh, in this area is replete with loss and very deep pain and trauma. Um, the, um, one of the more prominent events was um, the Navajo were forcibly removed from their traditional homeland during what's called the Long Walk, um, and they were marched several hundred miles south um, of, of Canyon de Chez National Monument, and there was um, quite a bit of loss of life and um, deep, lasting, multi-generational trauma from that. Um, additionally, like many uh, Native American tribes around the nation, um, uh, the, there were children who were forcibly removed from their uh, their homes and forced to live in boarding schools that prioritize cultural assimilation and eradication of native language and culture. Um, the gerrymandered voting districts in San Juan County in particular um, are egregious for the ways in which they um, suppress uh, native voting. But notably in San Juan County, um, a district judge ordered the county to redraw those districts. And because of that, um, what used to be a majority uh, Anglo commission now has two representatives instead of just one. And it's sort of a historic move forward for the county where natives will have more power. And moreover, natives who are very supportive of the Bears Ears National Monument um, will uh, be elected officials with a lot of say over public lands issues. Um, one, of the, one of the most uh, prominent um, figures in the Native community um, in this whole National Monument issue um, is Mark Mary Boy. He was the first Native elected official in San Juan County, and I believe in the state, uh, in 1986. Um, and he is the co-founder of Utah Denebikea, and we're going to hear from him about his connection to the land. We hope. In 1968, um, President uh, Bobby Kennedy came, mm -hmm. and he met with the elders right there where the trees are. Wow. He was running for the president, and <clears throat> that's when I guess you might say I was introduced to uh, politics. I was just a young kid running around all over the place, climbing around on those trees, and then my um, all of a sudden my dad went like this to me, son, all of those old people, they're going to be gone pretty soon. Listen to them, listen to what they have to say. So I sat down for a moment and watched those old people talk. And I noticed that they were talking about the land. Here, across, all the way into the Abajos, Bears Ears, Moab, Monticello, Salt Lake, Green River, and they told Bobby Kennedy, those are very important, and the land is who we are. It's something that sustained us for millions of years. Please, as our leader, remember that. Never, ever forget us, they told him. For many years, Mary Boy was a lone representative of Native peoples in San Juan County, where the Navajo and Ute Mountain Ute reservations comprise nearly a quarter of county land and more than half its population. As such, he bore the brunt of long festering racial tensions and the weight of his people's painful history. After he left public office, he began working to develop an inventory of sites that have passed in continuing significance to Navajos. He listened to the stories of elders working over the course of three years to create maps of cultural resources. They produced a book, Denebikea, that made a case for protection of critical portions of San Juan County's public lands. What UDB needed now was additional support from other sovereign tribal nations. We decided to invite other tribes because we thought that the government-to-government -government relationships tribe had with the United States would be an avenue for tribes to speak to the federal government. 
Over the next year, UDB staff and board members traveled to reservations across the Southwest, making the case to tribal leaders that despite their troubled histories, they had one thing in common, their cultural, historical, and spiritual connection to the land in southeastern Utah and their shared desire to protect it from development and desecration. The UDB staff and board invited representatives to a gathering in Bluff, Utah, during which they explored the Bears Ears landscape. We said to the Pueblos, Hopi, Zuni, and 19 other tribes, Welcome home. You have over 100,000 archaeological sites here. We told them that we've done the best we could to take care of those sites, but there are many pot hunters, people in the area, who have no respect. We need your help. Instantly, the tribes understood. In July 2015, the Hopi, Navajo, Ute Mountain Ute, Zuni, and Ute Indian tribe of the Uinta and Ure formed the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition to preserve a place that is integral to their cultural identity and essential for their spiritual survival. The practical and symbolic implications of this proposal are profound. For the first time, tribes would work as equals with the federal government in determining the fate of their ancestral lands. Time for more whirlwind history. Um, There's also a story of loss and deep pain in Mormon history, which is key to understanding their passionate feelings toward the land. Um, Ready to point? (laughs) Um, So in order to get to what they call their their deseret and their promised land in Salt Lake City, um, they journeyed from um, New York all the way through Nauvoo, Illinois, Missouri, uh, to get to Salt Lake City. And along the way, they were being uh, chased by people who um, found their homegrown religion to be uh, a bit frightening and wacky and really a threat to their status quo. Um, The uh, federal government uh, in the 1870s and 1880s um, went to Utah, not yet a state, so the territory, uh, federal marshals were sent to enforce laws against polygamy. Um, And as a condition of statehood, when Utah uh, joined the United States in 1896, um, they uh, were required to renounce polygamy. And um, notably, they also had to recognize uh, over 70% of Utah lands as public lands as a condition of statehood, which continues to be a bone of contention today. All right, we'll have to blow through this next one. But this is a seemingly wonky law that has great significance. It's called the Federal uh, Lands Policy and Management Act, also known as FLIPMA. Um, And so it changed the BLM's mandate, known by conservationists at that time as the Bureau of Livestock and Mining, um, to to have more of a conservationist mandate as well. They they couldn't just take multiple use into consideration. They also had to um, evaluate landscapes for um, their... Uh, their conservation assets as well. Um, This did not sit well with many rural Westerners who felt like this was undue government intrusion. It ignited a movement called the Sagebrush Rebellion, uh, which continues to flare across the West, most notably recently with um, the Bundys and their um, armed occupation of the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. Um, And finally, uh, and relevant to our next um, portrait, in uh, 1996 and 2009, in the community of Blanding in San Juan County, the FBI um, launched a series of raids um, to break up a uh, artifacts uh, looting trafficking ring, um, and uh, a number of people were arrested, and it left deep wounds in um, some of the uh, communities in San Juan County. Um, so one of the more polarizing figures in all of this is County Commissioner. He's a former County Commissioner in San Juan County. Uh, his name's Phil Lyman. Uh, he just won um, his race for Utah uh, House of Representatives, and he was one of the most uh, outspoken opponents of Bears Ears National Monument. So I think we're going to have to cut him short a little bit. Okay. But um, all right. His ancestral, his ancestral ties to the land run deep. His great-grandfather, Walter C. Lyman, was one of the original Mormon pioneers sent by the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1879 to settle southeastern Utah. Blanding is here because the pioneers were sent to live here at Grace Sacrifice. He takes us on a tour of his favorite places in San Juan County. Let's drive down here to Devil's Canyon he says, pointing to a topo map on a topo map to a thin black line that weaves its way through mesas studded with, uh, studded with pinion and cedar. You could pull off anywhere and find ruins. This is one of the coolest. 
His appreciation for the Native American ancestral sites that dot San Juan County's public lands seem genuine. There's a touch of wonder in his voice as he shares his thoughts. That impression is at odds with the image of Lyman propagated by the media and held by many locals, that of a prototypical states' rights sagebrush rebel determined to take back the land from the federal government and transfer it to the states. This image was cemented by his May 2014 ATV ride into nearby Recapture Canyon to protest BLM policies, a ride that endangered Native American artifacts near the sites uh, like the cliff dwelling he has just shown us. He and many others in San Juan County believe that the federal government and the BLM in particular have blood on their hands. On the morning of June 10, 2009, agents raided the homes of suspected looters and antiques dealers in Blanding, arresting 16 people. Locals recall the raid as dramatic and terrifying, with armed officers in flak jackets leading away nonviolent citizens in handcuffs and shackles. You don't do that to people. Just tell us why it happened. Please explain. Why were these people treated this way? Lyman became a folk hero because he dared to do what many others would not, stand against the federal government by refusing to abide by agency rules. The definition of local people is narrow. Native peoples and the conservation-minded are, for the most part, excluded. And the rallying cry of take back the land is factually suspect. Nevertheless, their words and cause spoke to rural Westerners who felt left behind or disrespected or who chafed at the rules laid down by the political establishment. Lyman's struggles with his fierce opposition to federal involvement in San Juan County's affairs and the need for future economic development in the county. No, don't kill the audio. It's good. <laughs> I was uh, one of the guys on our public lands council. He was just at my office yesterday, and, and I pulled up a map that I'd found. If someone had created this map of the Berger's proposal in it. And anyway, it's the Colorado Plateau. Colorado Plateau, and then it's... And I said, I said, look at this. We talked a little bit about the Colorado Plateau. I said, what's right in the middle of all of that? San Juan County. What's right in the middle of San Juan County? <laughs> These words have been written. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, said, I said, what's the worst thing that would happen for you in, individually if this was designated? And he said, you know, they have a bunch of land. And he said, honestly, for us, our land would probably go up in value. Probably. And I said, I'm thinking the same thing. For me, if I was selfish, I don't. I'm an I'm an accountant. I don't do books for Exxon Mobil and Denison Mines. I I do books for hotel owners and restaurant owners and guides and people that are tied into the tourism thing. So I look at this whole thing. If we want a local economy, you don't get that by big oil coming in. And it's great. They pay a lot of money to the county and help to pay for the schools, which is I don't don't diminish that at all. But just you know, going out and being able to open up a business and do something. And I said, I said I, as much as I don't want it to happen, you have to say, if it does, we'll, we'll maybe be better off. Um, so Heidi Red is a rancher with deep roots in with deep roots. Thank you, uh, in San Juan County. Um, she has she's kind of more of a moderate voice. She loves lands and public lands, wants to see them protected as wilderness. But she also understands the connection to these legacy industries of ranching and mining because of how they made the county prosperous in years past. So we asked her about the thoughts, uh, her thoughts on the economic future of the county, and this is what she had to say. I think mm -hmm. we do need tourism, mm -hmm. but I don't think that should be the only egg in the basket or mm -hmm. that we should exclude other possibilities. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, what this county has lived on for ages has been um, minerals extraction, mm -hmm. whether it's be uranium, potash, uh, you know, whatever, oil, gas, and um, it's been the bread and butter. It's, it's what's, I'll tell you what built our libraries, what built our schools, um, was uranium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the county was very judicious with the money they got from uranium. They built things like schools and libraries. They had the highest paying teachers in the state when in the 60s until that money. In fact, they invested that money so well that they're just now running out of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, I must say that they were very, very wise in planning. Um, but I don't think there's a there's a one 
kind of industry or whether it be tourism, mining, whatever, windmills, mm -hmm. I think we have to diversify as much as we can and look for every possibility for new jobs mm -hmm. and new technology. Um. And we'll move to the tribal perspective as well. So as we mentioned in July 2015, the representatives of these tribes formed the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. And here, two members of the coalition speak to the potential and the potential challenges of proposing this paradigm shift in how tribes and the federal government work together. So this is Regina Lopez Whiteskunk. She's a member of the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. And she's the former co-chair of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. So some words from um, Regina. We had a discussion about what sovereignty means to each of us, each of the tribes, and how, we're, um, how we've seen that tribes always say and throw out the word sovereignty, but nobody actually exercises and utilizes it to the capacity that they could. In that moment, we said, what would sovereignty look like if we were able to apply it to this what happened that day is what I call an awakening of true sovereign voices. It was like a puzzle piece that fit from the very beginning. The coalition has placed the concept of healing at the heart of its proposal, healing of the land and healing of the wounds between tribes, between tribes and the federal government, and between tribes and local Anglos. If we put ourselves out there, we could really be advocates for a lot of people to help them organize and elevate their voices. You know, one of the things that I communicated to the legislatures was I'm, I'm a spokesperson, not only for myself and my people, but for those that aren't able to speak for themselves, and that's the land, the water, the air, and the animals. They're not able to speak for themselves or advocate, and that's who I speak for as well. And then finally, we're, we'll hear from Carlton Boakety. He is a member of the Zuni tribe and uh, co-chair of the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition. So Zuni um, is located in um, New Mexico, but um, a lot of the uh, Native American archaeological sites you see in the Bears Ears region um, are uh, from Zuni, Hopi, uh, members of the Pueblos who now live in Arizona and New Mexico. And so this was one of the sticking points where it's like, why are these tribes for, that aren't from Utah getting involved? It's because there is physical evidence of their uh, forebears in the region. So anyway, here's Carlton. He felt an, a strong ancestral connection to the land as he flew over the area of the proposed monument and then hiked into the canyons of Cedar Mesa and the sandstone of Comb Ridge. The landscape is very similar, and once you get down on the ground and actually visit some of the sites, there's clear ancestral Puebloan ties to the area. You have cliff dwellings, you have rock art that's very similar to what you'll find in the Great Kivas and in some of the areas around here. We identify different plants that we use in our ceremonies. He believes that the um, Bears Ears Tribal Co Intertribal Coalition can work with the federal government. It's a change that may at first make some federal officials uncomfortable. However, he has faith that over time, tribal and U.S. governments can come to an agreement on a process that can serve as a template for other tribes and indigenous communities. I think it's here. Yeah. If it doesn't become a monument, we don't have anything to lose because we'll find different ways to make sure that is protected. Uh, but if it's challenged legally, that's fine. Go to the we, end. We, we, we've, we've played that battle before. We, we're committed. You, you're, you're not going to find any other partner that's as committed as we are, as the tribes are, because this is important to us. It's, it's a part of our cultural identity. If we don't fight for it, then who will? So in a sense, we, 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 we've expressed it, and I think once, once they understand that as partners, we're not going anywhere, we're not going to back out, we're not going to hedge, we're not going to, um, I, I guess, more or less roll over, we're going to stick by this. And we'll, we'll do what's necessary to make sure that it's realized and that we, um, that we, that we actually do have a place at the table, like I said. 
So just some final thoughts on what it might take to find common ground uh, in public lands issues across the West. Um, and, and these are based not on our, you know, not on opining upon our numerous long drives across the Colorado Plateau, but rather from speaking with uh, the people we interviewed about what they thought was necessary to find compromise. Um, First and foremost, be mindful of the history, culture, and economic needs of the diverse stakeholders. Show that you have an understanding of the issues, and you're not just going to impose these uh, supposed solutions from outside. Um, and hold discussions in the landscape. I think one of the biggest rubs for people in the West is that a lot of these federal decisions are being made with people who've never been to Dark Canyon or Moab or um, or the Flatirons or you know any anywhere where these issues are really resonant and where the effects of those policies are felt most directly. Um, and finally, it requires something that's in really short supply in this day and age. It requires patience and a commitment to. Um, to engage in this process for 5, 10, 15 years, a generation. Um, and in terms of San Juan County in particular, we'll leave you at this. An opportunity to find common ground exists outside of courtrooms and county commission meetings. It can be found in the canyons of Cedar Mesa, the spires and mesas of Valley of the Gods, the sculpted sandstone of White Canyon, and the meadows and forests surrounding Bears Ears. Natives and Anglos in San Juan County, regardless of spiritual beliefs or worldview, have used the same words to explain to us their connection to place. The land is who we are. The land is not just a place to live, explore, or make a living. It is everything. In their shared reverence for Bears Ears country lies hope. And my thought is that the arch of conversation bends toward compromise. 